comprehend why is it that you have troubled me in my wrath? I, it is only because you have beseeched me to be here that some modern fellow is not. But I guarantee you that what I will do is take and introduce you to what gave us the right to challenge the king. What gave us the right to push back against parliament? Some of what you have in your hand, in your book there, I understand that th this is Ohio, a territory. What was it part of? What, what was it that in the Northwest what? Yes. So Ohio became out of that, did it not? Well, with that, sir, I would enjoy you to take and look at what I found, because I wrote a third of the Massachusetts Constitution. And the most important portions that I ensured that were there with my cousin John and one other fellow, there were three of us that wrote that un initial Constitution. And in that, it was most important to me to make sure that individual rights were secured. They're given to us by God. And this you need to clearly understand. And I noticed that now, through, through this time element, that your Constitution, even in the preamble of it, says what? Before God. And then, in that Article I of your Constitution, as it was in the Massachusetts Constitution, is that it was to take and secure your rights, to the effect that what that gentleman was just talking about and what the other gentleman in the back was speaking to, there's no reason to be muzzled. No reason to be muzzled. But people do not understand this. They, they can't comprehend these things. And then this idea of taking away your firearms? Wait, what does that say there? The people have a right to bear arms for their defense and security. For your defense and security. Well, thank you, sir, for calling me forward. And with that, I want to talk to you about the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. But I would challenge you to understand this alone in your own state constitution. Because by understanding this, you will be able to, number one, support those lesser magistrates that are worthy of your support, as well as to challenge them, as I will talk about this evening. And I'm going to try and go through this quickly. It was prepared by some 21st century individual, so I will take and do my best to elaborate on what he put together. And as I understand it, there is a mechanism back there where you can put your name and information and get a copy of what this information is all about. The doctrine of the lesser magistrate is incumbent upon us to understand. And all these finagled things, I don't know, where did you come up with this stuff? My thesis my thesis, and you remember, I went to Harvard at 14 years old, and I don't have the time to go through it with you right now, and being 300 years old, I do need to, to look here. But I went to the Boston Grammar School, and in 1712, when it started, the curriculum was laid out like this. And you have to understand, you went to the Boston Grammar School at the age of seven. At seven. The first three years are spent learning by heart, then according to and ordering to the capacities of understanding the antecedents and the nomenclature and construing and parsing and ordering to the English rules of syntax. This is what you have to parse, what you have to understand, and what you have to put it into the proper syntax of English. Is the Sentinacia Pirellis? Cato and Cordinius, 
and Aesop's fables. Now, you have to understand, you have to be able to translate that from the Latin first. At seven years old, you'll learn that. The fourth year or sooner, if the capacities allow it, they are entered upon Aramaeus, to which they are allowed no English, but are taught to translate it by the help of the dictionary and antecedents, which English translations of there is written down fair and by each of them after reciting the lessons and then brought to the master for his observations and corrections, both as to the translation and the orthography. That's just a little bit of the curriculum, the very beginning of what I went to at seven years old and went to Harvard at 14 and when I graduated and then moved on to my master's. My master's thesis was because I, I heard some people say that I was a drunkard, that I was a rabble rouser, that I instigated people into riotous actions. What I did is I understood and I studied the Reformation because if you remember, my mother was of Puritan heritage and so I was brought up in that idea of that. So as I looked at my master's thesis at the age of 21, given before the whole council of the Massachusetts colonies, whether it be lawful to resist the supreme magistrate if the commonwealth cannot otherwise be preserved. By the way, I delivered it in Latin. But that alone, who would be inspired and what would inspire you to think that is it lawful to resist the magistrate if the commonwealth could not otherwise be preserved? It comes down to what is the purpose of civil government as expressed in the Declaration of Independence, which I was there for that. My cousin John participated with Mr. Jefferson while I was working on the Articles of Confederation, so I understand what it means to put together a constitution. There is a God. Our rights come from him, and simply, and the purpose of civil government is to protect and secure those God-given rights. I even wrote that into the first article of the Massachusetts Constitution. So we're going to be talking about this whole idea of interposition. And this is the very tip of the iceberg, and I will not take a lot of your time this evening because I honor your time. Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrate is, again, declared in the Declaration of Independence, and it started in the place called Magdeburg, a city that was at the trade routes very prominent, right between Berlin and Hanover. It was determined to recover their federal and covenantal, their biblical understanding and truths. What happened, what happened is that this was a center of the Lutheran religion as Protestantism was moving forward in the day. In 1544, Charles came against not only the Turks, he put in an alliance with the Pope, and they came with May 15th of 1548, the Osberg Interim, which imposed upon the German people the requirements of all evangelicals to reject everything that Luther put up in his 99 thesis and return to all that Catholicism has offered. Magdeburg said no. And it wasn't just the people. It wasn't just the people. It was the magistrates that understood what we said earlier. There is a God. He gave us our rights. And the purpose of civil government is to protect those rights, those God-given rights. They understood this. Therefore, they refused, and they were under siege. In essence, if it was not for Magdeburg, 
all of Protestantism throughout that area of Germany, all the way through to Italy, the Holy Roman Empire would have been wiped out. Now, there were pockets of things that were going on in England, but the whole continent would have been wiped out. The young man from your century has taken and put together a number of different references. And these references can take you into the lower portions of that iceberg. There are two books that a young man by the name of Matt, I have a hard time with some names. He actually took and put together and translated into the English the Magdeburg Confession and all the things that it covers, the references there. He also then brought that into easy to understand information on the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. So those books are available based on those references. But for me, I did study Althusius. Johannes Althusius was one of the key people that brought together the idea of federalism. What is federalism? That doctrine itself. How did he get that out of scriptures and out of common sense, out of history, out of the Greek and Roman ideas of governance? The idea of covenant. A constitution is a covenant between each of you. It's a bond between each of us into civil society. So it's not those that you may elect. And you have to understand, I was an elected official. So that gave me the capacity to act as I did. Not being a drunkard and a rabble rouser, but being someone in an elected position to be able to act and sustain everything that we started off speaking of. I understand that political parties have formed and that in the political parties there's something that's called a precinct committee person. Are, are those people elected? Is a precinct committee per Yes, they're elected. So you're an elected official. You as an elected official have the right and capacity to act according to this doctrine of the lesser magistrate. And if you did you take an oath to the Constitution of the State of Ohio and the United States, then if you do not act on that and hold the higher magistrates accountable, you're an oath breaker. You violate an oath before God if you do not challenge those and that which you swore you would protect. And that's because you have a relationship with everybody else here by virtue of taking that oath and saying you will protect and defend that Constitution. The doctrine of the lesser magistrate is a, a confession that's constructed basically on the articles of faith that were outlined in the Augustana. The second part of it deals with the defense for the resistance of the lesser magistrates and higher authorities. There's many, as I understand it, in your modern day that are modern Tory pastors. They're sworn to the crown. They're sworn to the government and not to what Scripture teaches. Even during my time, there were many that would falsely teach the doctrine that would come out of the Romans 13. But the truth of it is that when Jesus made his procession into Jerusalem, a glorious day, what was his next action? His next action was to go to Temple Mount and to take and make a whip, turn over tables and whip those that were there, and challenge. He always challenged the authorities. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the scribes were not just religious leaders. They were the political leaders of the day. They were the political leaders. And Jesus challenged them. So 
one of the reasons that you are where you are, different from me, our pulpits understood this. Our pulpits preached the full truth of the scriptures. Our pulpits stood on what liberty was. The first great awakening was during my lifetime. I met George Whitfield. I knew who he was. He was influential in my life when he spoke at Harvard. My sister was pen pals with him. And when it came time to try and get the Stamp Act repealed, my sister asked me to write to George Whitfield and appeal to him because he was back in England to get that repealed. And he was able to go before Parliament and find some reasons there in people's minds. The third part is an exhortation to all who would aid Charles V in his war against evangelicals. This portion also included the condemnation of all who would attempt to be bystanders and give no aid one way or the other. You see, even during my time, as we were moving into that period of breaking away from England, there were those that were merchants, there were those that were in the pulpits, there were those that would let us perish, and yet they were called upon here to act. The confession concludes with Psalm 93. The doctor no lesser magistrate teaches that no civil authority can make unjust immoral law, policy, or court opinion. Is that something I heard these other gentlemen say? Is something that is happening with your governor and, and more? Well, see, that happened with with our governor, I'm going to talk to you here about Governor Andros and what happened with him. You know, we had a revolution before the revolution of 76, actually starting in, what, 74, with those first shots at Lexington. Lower magistrates, lesser ranking civil authority has both the God-given right and duty to refuse obedience to that superior authority, and if necessary, actively resist the superior authority. If you understand your Old Testament, there was a lot of that that occurred. Lesser magistrate doctrine is rooted in historic Christian doctrine and interposition. The greatest interposition was when Jesus went to the cross. That was the greatest. But throughout all of biblical history and throughout the history of general history, there were times when interposition happened, when someone would take and, sir, you, you, you cannot go there and take his cane away. I, you, I'm sorry, you cannot go do that. It's getting in between somebody, stopping them from doing that which is unlawful or hurtful somebody else. I found, or I should say, in going over this material that this young man in your century put together, there's four levels of injustice that are delineated and extracted from that whole doctrine. Level one is not excessively atrocious governor. Level two is the lawless tyrant. Level three, the coercive tyrant. Four, the persecutor of God. Where are you in that? Interesting. So if we go with the excessively atrocious governor, and it's just by their natural weakness, they have their own vices and sins, by which either knowingly or wantonly they sometimes do injuries, not excessively atrocious, but what? It's okay. We can forgive them. You, well, we're only going to do this for 30, 60, 90 days. Yes. 
the lesser magistrate, you can bear that harm without being sinful and sinning. It's only, you know, just brief, it's not excessive atrociousness. The, the governor, he can be born patiently for that 30, 60, 90 days. Lawless tyrants, atrocious and notorious injuries. Governor violates his own oath. Does your governor really understand Article 1 of your state constitution? I, and I understand because I know that the young man that prepared this, that, that he did a a presentation, a, what do you call that, a pod something? Oh, thank you. That that he did that about a, your governor who took his oath of office on nine Bibles. Yes. Took his oath of office on nine Bibles. So is he a violator nine times over? So then again, with the lesser magistrate, you have to understand where is it within your individual conscience, but also noting that if possible, it may be better to suffer in a Christian patience, yes, to suffer even injuries of this sort and to leave vengeance to God. When the injury affects individual men or a few men, and when the injury is able to be tolerated without sin. Coercive tyrants swells to the point beyond the innocent toleration is possible, is what? An inferior magistrate is forced to certain sin, violating your conscience. If you are part of, and God wants people to see your face, is that a violation of your conscience to be muzzled? Is it a violation of your conscience not to see and take care of your family? I think it, there, it's a commandment to honor your mother and father. And according to the Old Testament, what that means is to care for them, to be there for them, to participate in that family life. If that's violated, you're being forced to sin. Not able to suffer it without sin in defense is omitted. What's the accurate judgment? The authors of such injuries properly become and are called tyrants. You don't have to put up with it anymore. You're an elected official. Even if you're an appointed bureaucrat, it's your responsibility to act accordingly. Level four, the persecution of God. Tyrants become, become there's so much that they, they persecute with guile and arms, not so much the person of the inferior magistrate and their subjects as their rights itself, and they are persecuting God at the same time. I think that there's so much of that that people need to consider what that means. Doctrine of vocation. Are people really called to the pulpit? Just going to college, what does that mean? Does that mean that in our time, Harvard was established for being mostly ministers. When I went there, that's what my parents intended for me to be. But when I started studying the law, I knew that there was another calling for me, another vocation that I was called to. And that becomes a critical point, as many people suffer within their employments without understanding the vocations which God has called to them to or their children. The Magdeburg Confession did not wish to stir a popular revolt, but rather they urged the lesser magistrate to fulfill their vocation by interposing. In other words, the general populace was not to just rise up, but maybe there's a time, but it's appropriate. But we should call on and support those and make sure that those who are elected, whether they be your precinct committee person, your township trustees, your county commissioners, and so on, to stand up, hold to their oath of office. 
Declaration of Independence, the full title of the document speaks those volumes in Congress, July 4th, 1776. The unanimous declaration of the 13 United States in America. Unanimity. There's divisiveness that can happen. The Tories attempted to divide us within the colonies. Are there people out there trying to divide you? How do you, and, and what is this idea of unanimity being called upon by those which are God haters, haters of the Constitution, haters of everything that is created? What, what are they talking about? Unity. To act as we, the general public, or you, the general public, you need to have unanimity. Can you act? Geez, I said something earlier about our first revolution. First revolution was April in 1689 in Boston. They went against Governor Andros for his atrocities and all that he was doing. I perceive the revolution was there as it was here, as one of the lords in Parliament would say, by the unanimous agreement of the people. Again, unanimity. In other words, the primary understanding of the resistance was advocated based on the glorious revolution in Britain and the individual rights to stand up for liberty. You see, it's on their own, your own necessity for safety and defense from imminent danger that causes you to action. Justification of the revolution, there was a lot that was going on. What illegal and arbitrary actions that the governor was taking. Does your governor at that point that you believe that he's doing arbitrary, illegal, pernicious actions? Yes. Illegal violations of the original charter. What about your Constitution? You're, you have Article 1 of your Constitution in your hands. Is that something that he's violating your rights? Right there. Those are your rights secured by God for you that are put together and solidified in that covenant called the Ohio Constitution. We had of that rebellion... Cotton Mather, one of the primary pastors of the day, supported that activity. Samuel Sewell, he argued, the scriptures speak of a lawful and good rebellion as well as of that which is unlawful. You have to have that understanding as I talked earlier of what that is, what that means. Calvin, a lot of people who understand what Calvin wrote would say, well, Calvin never said that that was okay. Well, as Calvin matured and he understand more, he did write that there is a time when magistrates in particular need to wrote bell against those higher authorities. Cotton Mather again in 1725, when he said there a loud voice from heaven to France. 1747, on Election Day sermon, Charles Chauncey, he was supportive of private individuals actively resisting tyranny if the inferior magistrates were not able or willing to do it. That's why it's so incumbent upon you to not only write letters, but as the plea by that gentleman and several earlier, go. Go. On a Tuesday morning is early. Take your tea or coffee and go. Support those that are acting. Now, one gentleman that was up here, I believe he's appointed to one of your commissions. Is that not correct? He needs your support. Go. 
support him and others. It's difficult to take of our time, but if liberty is that important, what is time? What is eternity? 1749, a Congregationalist minister, Jonathan Todd, preached an Election Day sermon. I will not read all of that. You, you can get these notes. But the whole point of it comes down to the end. The law of self-defense is in force amongst the people, and they may judge that God is to be obeyed rather than man. I'm sure you've heard that before. Lesser magistrates or the individual. Stamp Act crisis, I inferred to that much earlier. And uh, it was a very critical time. The Declaratory Acts, 1776, Parliament decided that, oh, you know what, we'll pull off the Stamp Act, but you know what, we're going to be able to do whatever we want to do. One of the things that young gentleman that was up here earlier was talking about in relationship to all these different businesses and all of that, we actually put into place a, what I will call the non-participation agreement amongst the colonies. And in that, we said, no, as much as it's going to hurt, we will not buy from that store. As much as it's causing us our personal pain, we will not go to that establishment. We will not spend our money. We will not allow those merchants from England to rule our lives because I can discuss a lot about that with you. It ultimately came down to, at one point, even that the ladies, the young ladies, the young ladies, they said, we will no longer drink the tea or use the bolts of cloth coming from England. You see, America had all its manufacturing shut down, and it was what I would call the global merchants of the East India Trading Company that was forcing the colonies into slavery. No. No. A dictionary. First, the Federalism Perspective for a Nation, Random House Dictionary, the doctrine that individual state of the U.S. may oppose any federal action it believes encroaches on its sovereignty. 1966. Oh, my. Wow. Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition, the doctrine that a state in the exercise of its sovereignty may reject a mandate of federal government deemed to be unconstitutional or to exceed the powers delegated to the federal government. How, how did those words, how did the definitions, how were they allowed to change? Do you have that happening now? An evolving legal status of the cities, going from medieval common law all the way through things that emerged in the 1800s. And his trustees on the constitutional limitation, the people retain a sovereign right to local self-governance. Early idea of what is home rule. And as I think I understand it, and one of the gentlemen there, that young man that spoke earlier, I believe in your state of Ohio, out of what, 88 counties, there's only two counties that act under home rule. The rest operate based on the Ohio Constitution and your rule of law. And those counties are, I believe, Summit County and Cuyahoga County. But there's so much that is there for cities and townships that we don't have time to even talk about. But Article 10 in your Ohio government, it looks like it was shown to me here that the organization and government of counties with home rule, oh yeah, it is Summit and Cuyahoga. Let's see. But you have key points here. You have township trustees, I believe are your 
other than your precinct people are your lowest magistrates. You have those that are elected in your villages, in your cities, and then those that are in your counties. How does your county government work? I believe that young man back there has very good insight into it. What do you do? I want to take, and again, respectful of your time. What do you do? Return to your foundational roots. Not just understand the federal constitution, which I believe in the back there is, for those that are interested in classes about the federal constitution, there's some place that you can request information about that. But the Ohio Constitution, and the same organization that is putting on the federal constitution classes is developing classes for the Ohio Constitution. So there's information to gain on that. Encourage your pastors and church elders to understand these truths of the foundation that I learned from the Reformation. Not just what they pick and choose. It means that you have to study as well and understand these truths. That's what we understood. Persuade the elected at every level, even your precinct committee person, to hold community gatherings. We had regular meetings within our community. We had not listening to what some politician was going to tell us what they were going to do. We wrote, because I wrote, many of them, letters of instruction. Your political state, political elected, need to come back to you, the constituents, and hear from you at least once a quarter. But you have to talk to your township leaders, your township trustees, to call for them to come out of their, what, granite and marble palace and return to see you face to face unmuzzled. Initiate citizens' development of platform planks that drive policy. If you have no mechanism or means to hold the elected accountable, such as letters of instructions or uh, a platform from your organization, then there's nothing there that, that any elected person is going to pay attention to. Demand your political parties to have platforms with teeth and accountability, especially those within the, the precincts or those that have that influence within that. Demand them. That's your right as people, as citizens, to charge those you elected in your precincts to act in your best interest, even within that political party, and not allowing a political party to determine what's their interest for you. Implementation for today get to know those officials, get to know those that elected, get to know those that are running. Vet them appropriately. Know your foundational truths. That is something over and over to, to know. Introduce those elected to this doctrine of lesser magistrate. Actively work in those areas, as you heard, the plea, the petition earlier. It's important. In Massachusetts, when we had our community meeting, everyone participated and was required to participate. Even the village idiot had a voice. I wonder how many village idiots you may have. In your own community. Actively work to bring constitutional principles and resolution decrees law and adjudication. Something that was given to me by that young man earlier is a, a script, and I only uh, have a couple copies that he left for me, but again, if I get your email address, I will make sure that he 
knows how to do that for you. But this is a script for the liberty restoration via the doctrine of the lesser magistrate at local government meetings, township trustees, city councils, county commissioners, etc. And this has to deal with the, I call the muzzles. Uh, this is specific to Ohio and talks about ORC 473141473134. And uh, this was evaluated by a constitutional attorney, someone that ran for president of the United States. That young man, as well as a couple other people, have interacted with this person to bring this language to something that you could go and read in front of your township trustee. You could go and take to your county commissioners, your village trustees, even the head of your political parties. They need to act according to the truths. Do you have a precinct committee handbook, a training manual? If you were elected to that position, where did you get a training manual? No. No. The, this here is the precinct committee person serves as the main communication source between the Indiana Democratic Party and the current future Democrats in his or her pre... What? What, 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 who are you affiliated with? Most of you, if you're affiliated with a political party, Republican. Now, Thomas Jefferson had this unique idea of the Democrat Republican Party or Republican Democrat Party. He tried to cover all bases with that. And I was a proponent of what Mr. Jefferson was doing. But the, it gives you some ideas of responsibility. So when it comes to the, uh, here in Ohio, as the young man told me that maybe Lake County, a county I think north of you, does have a precinct training manual. But when it comes to the Ohio Republicans, as I understand it, it's nothing. All the way to your state level. I know that the young man that helped prepare this or did prepare this is working with a statewide PAC in helping write a training manual that can be disseminated to those that could be interested in what that would be. What do you implement today? You're not finding that lesser magistrate willing to act responsibly. You need to participate in citizens groups just like you are here today. But there's other groups as well that are doing a lot of good effort against the things of the muzzling as well as uh, other activities. So I understand this oh, uh, Free Ohio Now is throughout the state of Ohio. I think it's in like 37 different counties. Very, very active in doing a number of, of liberty-minded actions. Ohio Stand Up, I believe they have two federal lawsuits going right now against the governor on all of his actions. And I know that the ones, I was told that the one lawsuit is uh, making good progress. There was also, I believe, a lawsuit in a county called Ashland. Ohio, where a judge there declared the muzzling unconstitutional according to the Ohio Constitution. Now it'll be whether you, as the gentleman earlier said, will you take that ruling and hand it to the other businesses of like kind? I believe from the young man that a, a restaurant that he visited in North Canton was under attack in that county. I believe that's a Stark 
County or something there. And that after this judgment, the persecutors in that county dropped all charges. You have a problem with your health director? Your trustees, township trustees, are the ones that develop that health board and place the people on that health board. I think a young man back there said that he submitted to stand up for that and tried to he petitioned to be on that board, but he was not accepted. It's your trustees. Your trustees can go back to that board, that health board, and your trustees can rein in your health director if you will support your trustees that are willing to take that action. Hmm. I wonder what this says. Ohio Advocates for Medical Freedom. They help develop the initial. I think there's a place where people can, like a, a newspaper, where people can go and see a lot of different information. Free Ohio Now has posted all the information from both Ohio Stands Up and Ohio Advocates for Medical Freedom. These groups have formed a coalition to work together for your liberty. Moms Against DeWine, the We the People Convention, all in Ohio. Find them. Not only everything that you're being asked to help here, at least you can garner information that could be helpful in what you're doing locally and gain their support as well. I know that this Free Ohio Now group will take and if they find a restaurant or a business that will stand up against the muzzling, they will put you on their calendar if you so like, and we'll have 50 to 100 like-minded patriots come and support the business. Quotes for today, and I'll leave it with this. For the traitor appears not a traitor. He speaks in an accent familiar to his victims. And he wears their face and their arguments. He appeals to the baseness that lies deep in the hearts of all men. He rots the soul of a nation. He works secretly and unknown in the night to undermine the pillars of the city. He infects the body politic so that it can no longer resist. Didn't you hear about that earlier? Why is it that so many people will not unmuzzle? A murderer is less to fear. The traitor is the plague. Marcus Tullius Cicero. The goal of the communists is to enter into the men, into men's minds and cast God down from his throne. A person's character is shown through their actions in life, not where they sit on Sunday. If you can help Sam Adams, uh, there's information back there on the how to get the program promos, how to get this presentation. And apparently this young fellow has something to do with uh, culinary peppers and jams, and that's how they take and uh, support this activity. With that, thank you.